Because of the following special broadcast, The Lucy Show and The Andy Griffith Show will not be presented this evening. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Happy to welcome Matthew Clickstein to Word Balloon again, but on a very weird day because uh, the Screen Actors Guild has joined the Writers Guild on strike. Uh, it just happened this afternoon, and we're finding out all the details. I think things are kind of murky. Uh, they they we, we already knew that when uh, the actors... First of all, Mac, Matthew, sorry, welcome. Good to see you. Close and, and I'm and yeah, man. Uh, again, I'm sorry that we have Matthew to click Steen, not click stand, but close enough. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. I, oh, you, oh, you wrote that. I didn't write that. Oh, I did. Oh, well, yeah, yeah that's you, right. man. Uh, whatever. Yeah. All right, because yeah, I, I see that. Like, Wait a minute, that's that. Yeah, I didn't do yeah. that. No, no, no. I got it spelled right enough. on my end. My, the I eye get... on my keyboard doesn't work sometimes for some reason, so that's probably <laughs> it. Totally, it totally yeah. is cool, man. But uh, no, I, I I made sure one T and Matthew and uh, I. <laughs> <even> <laughs> That is a lot, yeah. But Absolutely, buddy. So anyway, um, yeah, you know, I, 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 we were all anticipating, and in fact, in conversation with comic creators and writers guild members and actors, uh, expected uh, a lot of demonstrations uh, at San Diego this year, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that all turns out. I'm but now the pictures of it that people are sending me, the protesters are already starting, and um, you know. It's gonna it's gonna make it very uh, unique a unique con experience for sure. We're gonna literally have to cross the line to get in there, but yeah, got to do what you got to do. You know? Well, and 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 we'll see. I mean, re early reports are. I don't even want to say the details because I want clarification before it because it may even impact upcoming episodes of Word Balloon. Because I've even talked to a few SAG members about coming on and talking about things. We'll see what happens. Like I said, I don't even want to go into the details of it, but we are here. To once again uh, talk about not only Matthew's great book, See You at San Diego, this incredible oral history of Comic-Con, fandom, and as it says here on the cover, The Triumph of Geek Culture, a wonderful project, a wonderful book. And uh, geez, Matthew, you know, I know you're going to be there representing the book and all, uh, but it, it is a little disappointing. And I'll let you tell the details of how um, Comic-Con could be a bit more accommodating. Uh, to what I think some of the things you and um, the organizers uh, of Comic Con originally wanted to do. So, so please tell us what your plans were. Tell us what you are going to be able to do and what you're not going to be able to do. Uh, yes, uh, John. As, as always, I always love being on your show, and I appreciate it. Um, you've been such a supporter of our project since day one, back when it was still a uh, a podcast series that we did with Sirius XM and Stitcher, Comic-Con Begins, which is free. And I found out uh, they finally have put it back up on all of the audio platforms. So great to hear, Matthew. Yeah, sure. because uh, I realized that it was not on all the audio platforms like Spotify and others um, for a clerical error or something. It is what it is. Uh, we live, a lot of people like to say we live in the time of Orwell. I think we live in the time of Kafka. Um, just bureaucracy is very interesting these days and it, it's almost, it's impossible to get angry at these people. It's more of just to be kind of shocked and amazed at, um, the mistakes that get made. It's not like it's vindictive or vicious. It's just errors. Uh, but the point is if people want to listen to the podcast series, Comic-Con begins, it's available free everywhere. I think as of tomorrow, uh, cause it's going to take a few hours to get back up where it belongs. Okay. Um, 
But um, yeah, we um, look, I have been working with the people who created Comic Con and were there at the very beginning, were there during the prehistory of Comic Con back in San Diego in the late 60s. Barry Alfonso, Mike Towery, Scott Shaw, Wendy All, Brink Stevens, uh, Dave Clark, Roger Friedman. Dave Scroge, Jim Cornelius, the people whose names you might not know necessarily, aside from if you're watching this, probably Scott Shaw, um, but who really were there when it was all happening. And when we first put together the podcast and then the book, it was about preserving the legacy, heritage, and history of not only Comic-Con, but the entire community that first bolstered Comic-Con and that Comic-Con was about fandom going back at least as far as the 1930s to the first world con in New York, of course, in 39 and all of the amazing stories and twilight zone and uh, projects by people like Bill Shelley and Bill Warren. And, you know, the, the folks that really came before us, Gilbert Seldes and Joan Winston and all these different people who really were writing about fandom before people even knew what that really was. Um, and we're trying to continue that legacy, both because we want the story to be told by the people who actually created this community, this Comic-Con community, but also because sadly we're starting to lose these people. Um, Gene Henderson, another name a lot of people probably might not know, he's already gone. Greg Bear, very big person in the science fiction world. Um, and was one of the co-creators of Comic-Con. They're actually more or less doing a tribute to Greg at Comic-Con this year. A lot of people are not too happy about the timing of the panel, um, but uh, they are doing it at least, a memorial, uh, which is well-deserved. Greg was a big contributor to our project. Astrid, his lovely wife, is the daughter of Paul Anderson, another great com uh, science fiction author. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the first big Star Trek cosplay people. Um, she is fantastic, a lovely woman, and really is carrying on both her own and her father's and Greg's legacy. Um, and, uh, you know, these are the people we worked with to tell their stories from the people who made it happen before they're all gone. And this is very important. And yes, as you said, I will be at Comic Con. I'll be at the Fanographics booth, uh, number 1721, every single day. Uh, the schedule's out there. Uh, we'll have some special guests as well. Great people that I'm going to be in the uh, arena with uh, at Fanographics booth. Bill Griffith, Jaime Hernandez, Trina Robbins, who's a big part of our book and I've done some events with as well. Trina's an amazing person in so many different ways. Yes. Um, and Carol Tyler and a number of the big name Fanographics people. And I'm so proud to be there sitting next to them doing signings at that Fanographics booth. That information's out there specifically for every day of the signings we're doing. Um, but as you said, John, you know, let's get into it. Uh, sadly, Comic-Con International, as it's now called, uh, has been extremely dismissive of our projects. Um, a number of people would say that they're kind of whitewashing their own history and legacy, that they are ignoring a lot of the people who helped to create their community. And um, it's been very frustrating. It's been very sad. It's been demoralizing and discouraging. Look, there's a Comic-Con museum, which we talk about in detail in the book and the podcast. And the book is not available in the uh, the gift store there. And look, I, you know, it, I, I work with Fanographics. They do an amazing project. They do an amazing design. Gary Groth is a fantastic person in a lot of ways. But, you know, it's, it's a relatively small independent company. There's not, not a lot of money there. Um, I'm already in debt on this project from the money that I've been spending on touring around and going to different museums and colleges and stuff. We're not doing this for money. We're doing this because we want to make sure the legacy and the history of not just Comic-Con, as I said, but the entire community around Comic-Con is told correctly. And there's so much misinformation and so much disinformation out there, not just about Comic-Con, but about the community, the geek culture community, the fandom community. 
that we want it told right. And we want it told right before more of these people are gone and can't tell that story anymore. And so the fact that CCI, Comic-Con International, has done absolutely nothing to help support this project and has been dismissive of it and certain members of their committee have been a little maligning of it, it, it's upsetting a lot of people. And I'm trying to stay out of the fray. I really am. I'm not about conflict. I'm not about confrontation. I would love to work with them to help promote this story and help promote the materials that we've acquired over the last few years, including from places like San Diego State University and other colleges and museums. People see what we're doing and they want to help and they want to help promote it. And it's just strange to a lot of people that the actual organization as it's run today has done nothing to assist us and to promote it in their own way. And indeed, twice now have rejected panels that we've tried to do with the people involved. And look, at the end of the day, the people involved, the people who created Comic-Con, who are thankfully still alive and trying to tell their story, you know, they're upset about it too, a lot of them, because it, they feel like it's a slight against them by Comic-Con. To be clear, this is an oral history, as was the podcast. This is not me, Matthew Clickstein, telling this story. This is not my analysis or speculation of it. It is a hundred hours of interviews with these people telling their stories, some two, three, four hours cut together in a well-crafted, well-constructed, well-designed by a great designer, Jonathan Barley book. And you can hear it as, also as a podcast, uh, Comic-Con Begins. There's no reason that CCI should be rejecting us and should be pushing us away. We're doing what they have, for whatever reason, not been able to do um, and have not been doing. And there are people even saying, why isn't there a larger presence of the Comic-Con history even at their own museum? And here we are. We're ready to do it. We have the materials. We have the access. There's no reason they should be pushing so hard against us. It just doesn't make sense. And it's upsetting a lot of people. Um, and it's very noticeable what they're doing. So they can say, oh, you know, we get a lot of different panel requests and blah, blah, about even the Eisners, to be perfectly frank, and some of the other things that they're in charge of and control of. And we can just sit back and say, look, everyone knows what's going on. It's very clear what's happening. You know, work with us, partner with us. Let's let's do this together. Let's tell your story. Um, and they, they don't want to do it. And it's it's very odd and it's very sad. And we're losing people like Greg Bear. Um, and they, they need to get moving on it. They need to help out. And uh, I don't know what else to say. It's, it's a sad and frustrating situation. Yeah, why why deny your own history? And I wonder, Matthew, have have they given any sort of official word beyond a blanket or or generic? Yeah, you know, thanks for the submission of the panel. I see I see you nodding. No, I'm saying this for the audio audience. Yeah, no, yeah. it's 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 insane and truly it flies in the face of some of the best things I've experienced at previous Comic Cons. Yeah, um, I got to meet uh, George Clayton Johnson exactly when he was on his uh, his literally his last appearance at Comic Con, and my good friend Andy Parks and I of Comic Books ran up. Uh, we we uh, waited until like we we were late to the panel and the door was closed. We waited until the panel was over so we could at least meet him coming out, and it was so wonderful. And we're like, oh, thank you so much. My God, your contributions, like you mentioned, Paul Anderson, Paul Anderson for from science fiction. I mean, George J Johnson wrote great episodes of The Twilight Zone. You can look it up, everybody. He wrote the first aired Star Trek episode, The Man Trap. He was the co-writer of Logan's Run. And, you know, him. Or, and Ocean's uh, Eleven, the original. And, yes, Eleven. you're right. The original that, story. Yeah. 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 George Johnson is an amazing person. Absolutely, absolutely man. And, and, you know, I mean, that's the thing. And, and you know, I was going to say, like, Ray, Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen, I mean, the way they honor various creators who are very much part of uh, the history that your book represents. And everybody, listen to me. You see the cover. Uh, here, let me, let me hold up fingers. <laughs> this is dictionary-sized as far as... All the pages. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's so funny, Matthew. I just got a new copy at our apartment building of the Yellow Pages. Really? Oh, wow, what it used to be, man. Amazing. I mean, it's like the size of a bridal magazine today <laughs> compared to the wow. dictionary size that the Yellow Pages used to used be. To be right? But certainly, I mean, this is the thing, everybody. You can buy See You at San Diego, published by Fanagraphics. 
available at Amazon and available at most booksellers. It is so worth the cover price because this thing is one of those books that's going to cut off your circulation if you got the if you got the book on your lap. And uh, I speak from experience and blue <laughs> as a, as a consequence. It's it is a great read. The podcast Comic Con begins. Correct, mm -hmm. that's the title. Mm -hmm. Amazing thing. Brink Stevens is the narrator. You've got wonderful, just as the cover suggests, Stan Smith uh, or Stan Sakai, Jeff Smith, the RZA. Uh, so many celebrities who over the years have been at and supported San Diego. And I get maybe, and this is my supposition, uh, supposition that it's an unauthorized that and it maybe is, yeah. Are, and maybe we, that's we, why. We, and we make we we make that clear at the end of the book. Um, and, and look, some of the best documentaries and biographies and analyses and oral histories, even of a lot of established entities, are unauthorized. And look, I spoke with a representative of Comic Con. Uh, when the podcast came out, and he admitted to me that he was very impressed with what we did with the podcast, was really uh, honored by it, thought it was very well done. We, we spoke for about an hour, hour and a half about how much he enjoyed it, but he did say that they can't promote or support in any way anything that's unauthorized. And he also said that he understood why we did it that way, because otherwise, there committee rule by committee is the most inefficient useless way of handling anything and we would have not been able to release the podcast in the time that we want to release it in or this book in the time that we want to we'd still be working on it because there would be all these different people arguing with each other and what should this word be and who should this person be and should we have this in there rule by committee is horrendous it doesn't work um, and even this representative of Comic-Con, um, who is well-known and notable and that people would recognize the name of, um, admitted to me that he understood why we kept it unauthorized. Plus, not only just for the time uh, prohibition that we would have had and inhibition that we would have had, which was substantial, but also he knew that there's certain things we would have had to expurgate. And we would have had to censor certain elements and whatnot. That's why when you see a lot of these documentaries or read certain books um, that are authorized biographies or autobiographies of certain people or institutions, they they come off as very you know they're like hagiographies. Hey, I mean they're they're they're, they're you got to have that warts and all aspect. Comic Con is an amazing, phenomenal global experience, but there is some dark side and. There was a lot of drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Ooh, it was a bunch of artists in the <laughs> 60s and 70s making this. What do you think they were doing? They were Absolutely, man. in friggin' California. Sorry, that existed. All these underground comics people were coming down from San sure. Francisco and Berkeley. You don't think that that was going on there? Like, sorry, I don't know what to tell you. Um, it's not so puritanical. And that we are representing and showing and talking about that part of the story, Dr. Timothy Leary, the most dangerous man in America, according to Nixon, was a special guest at Comic-Con in 1976. And you know what? It was a very interesting story told by a number of different people. You know, Scott Shaw at an earlier convention before Comic-Con even started, dressed up as his character, the turd, and covered himself in peanut butter. And when he later washed himself off, it blew up the, the plumbing at the hotel. These <laughs> things happened. I don't know what to tell you. And certain members of the Comic-Con committee these days might want to erase all that. But it's part of what makes this story so valuable and compelling and engaging and beautiful and powerful is it wasn't just a bunch of you know, Revenge of the Nerds, Landa, 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 glasses and tie-wearing, pocket-protecting nerds selling and talking about and buying comic books. There was so much more to this story. And when you look at the pictures and the artwork, say in the book, we have over 400 pictures in art, these people look more like Easy Rider than they do Revenge of the Nerds. And that's because that's what they were. They had long hair and they were protesting Vietnam and they were listening to David Bowie and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and God knows whomever else and their own bands like the, you know, the all human orchestra and so forth. They were goofballs. They were having fun with it. 
It's why they loved Chuck Jones and Looney Tunes so much. It was, and the Marx Brothers, it was irreverent. It was absurdist and it was strange. And they made art out of it and they wanted to celebrate that. And the fact that CCI right now is completely ignoring it and dismissing us and maligning us and pushing us away is hurtful and frustrating and not true. It's not, they're, they're not embracing the reality of what we're doing. And um, we're getting tired of it. And it's becoming very obvious what's happening. Um, and that's all there is to it. And they can give whatever short, terse, little response they want to some of the people who are picking up on this important story um, and say, oh, you know, oh, pan we have a lot of panel uh, suggestions and oh, blah, blah, Eisner's and whatever else. But we all know what's going on. And, um, you know, they should at least be honest about it, that they don't want this part of the story told and that certain committee members um, even have a financial motivation to make sure they're the only ones whose books of photos, for example, um, are sold at the Comic-Con Museum, um, even if they leave out a lot of different people, people that are in our project. So I don't know what else to say. It's, you know, I've tried to be a nice, good boy and keep my mouth shut, but it's just becoming too obvious what's happening. And I care too much about these people who are involved in our project and worked with us during COVID and worked with us during the lockdown and have their own personal and medical and financial issues that they're dealing with and are continuing to support what we they, what we do and doing interviews and, and posting about us and going to events with us and signing books with us yeah. and making it clear this is their story too and Comic-Con is pushing that away and shame on them. Um, and it's really unfortunate um, and, uh, you know, we need to make sure that the story is told and told correctly. And if they're not going to do it, then we're going to do it and we're doing it. And um, I don't know what else to say aside from I wish that they would be a bit more accepting and open to what we're doing. Makes no sense, man. I mean, it's like telling the story of 60s rock and roll and not acknowledging the summer of love. Right. Uh, uh, Woodstock. Uh, and unfortunately, and now I'm suddenly blanking. Altamont. Altamont, exactly. <laughs> Altamont. Yeah, man. Sorry. That's part of the story. That's part of the story. That's and, part and of the story. And further, like you said, um, you know, uh, the fact that Comic-Con today reflects pop culture, it did originally as well. Yes. And it wasn't just comics. It was <laughs> film. It was television. And it was the counterculture creators the underground comics people and yeah this was part of the fun and part of the tapestry and that's it reminds everyone as you say that we're not the tri lambs that right. <laughs> i hate to say it but the even the tri lambs were were pretty fun and goofy oh, sure. and, goofy and you know, the panty <laughs> raids they were having fun too the, i mean come but the, on. But, I mean, but the cool kids you know, the cool yeah. kids understood I right. mean, that's the thing. The cool yeah. kids wanted to hang out with the tri lambs yeah, and be no, like, absolutely. yeah, this is fun, man. Let's all get together. You know what? And I, I have to say, happening. as they as they called the human being and Woodstock, it was a hap Comic Con was a happening and is important to that tapestry of counterculture of the late 60s and early 70s, just like the music festivals. Please go on, Matthew. I was just going to say one thing I love talking about is. This entire project really stemmed from a book project I did going back to 2014 about so-called nerd and geek culture. That was actually how I first met Wendy All, A-L-L, -L, who was one of the, uh, you know, was there in the early stages of Comic-Con and really helped us to get this project going. She remains a very close friend, wonderful woman, and went on to do a lot of stuff for Hasbro and Mattel, got into the toy design industry and so forth. Um, but when I was working on that early project, I was really focusing a lot on the film Revenge of the Nerds. Um, and I got, a, I got a chance to talk to Curtis Armstrong, a.k.a. Booger, uh, from Revenge of the Nerds. And one of my favorite stories he told me, one of my favorite little tidbits that you might not know about, is, of course, I said, for anyone who's seen the movie, you might wonder, how did Booger end up at this kind of elite intellectual college where either you were you know a football player jock who got in because of a scholarship or you were one of these kind of more nerdy intellectual types like the land of landas and curtis armstrong told me something and if you watch the movie it's true 
he goes, as much as he might seem like this slob and the long hair and their leather jacket and shirts that say who farted and whatever else, <laughs> there's a lot of times when you see Booger's character where he's reading a book. And Curtis Armstrong told me that was his idea. He always kept a book with him. And when there's little moments, you can see him in the background or when he's not talking, he's reading a book. And his idea was Booger was a writer. Booger was this great literary talent. Um, and that's kind of why he looked how he looked and he acted how he looked. And I've always remembered that and loved that answer because it really is like, how did Booger end up with the nerds? It's like, well, he was a creative and he decided to dress and look and act like a weirdo. But if you watch the movie, Curtis Armstrong, the actor, snuck in him reading a book in the corners every now and then. And that's true. If, if you watch the movie, it's true, actually. So I love that you can have a character like Booger and he can be just as smart and clever and interesting as the rest of these guys. The only other thing I'll say about it is I actually had a history teacher in seventh grade who showed us an episode of the Simpsons at one point and we kind of broke it down and deconstructed it. And so too, the same thing he goes, is, do you guys think that Bart Simpson is stupid? Do you think he's dumb? And we had a long discussion about it. And he goes, Bart is shrewd. Shrewd is the word for Bart. Because if you think about it, much like Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes is another good example. When he needed to be smart, he could be smart. Yeah. He knew what he knew. He was able to make plans and strategize. And Bart and Calvin and Booger... And these other quirky characters from pop culture, they're not stupid. They're not idiots. They're not goofballs. They're shrewd. They're good at what they're good at. And I love that idea. And that goes back to even our Comic-Con community where you have a lot of weirdos and goofballs and outsiders. But, boy, they sure know a lot about Star Trek or they sure know a lot about <laughs> Ultraman or they sure know a lot about Godzilla um, or George Clayton Johnson or the Twilight Zone. Um, and I think that that's a lot of what this community and scene is all about, celebrating not only the creators of these projects and stories, but also the fans and those people who really care about this and are guided by the light of these projects, who have created technology and have come up with political policy and who have developed their own books and movies and projects and are running and are playing basketball and football and hockey because they are inspired and food now even because they're inspired yeah. by these books and movies and television shows. It's not pop culture anymore. Let's just say it. Culture. It is culture. <laughs> it's not pop culture. It's right. culture. It's no, right. everything we want. Yeah, God, I was there when Anthony Bourdain was at Comic-Con. And it was so I mean, great. Of course, it was. Of course. And, uh, I mean, and also, it doesn't surprise me. Isn't it a shame that um, uh, you know that that these guys didn't live a little longer? And I'm about to mention the Harlan Ellisons, the Ray Bradburys, yes. the Ray Harryhausens, who I really think would be on your guys' side and Absolutely. be like, "Hey, That's this is our history. Don't you dare deny our history." Yeah. And really would likely, uh, you know, yell truth to power with the cci people and say listen you gotta or even neil adams i mean neil yes. adams was a great peacemaker yes he was when, when he was faced with the establishment going we don't know joe schuster and uh, jerry siegel anything and it's like wait a minute let's all sit down and relax these guys create you your people created comic-con yes. give them their due yeah and it and it, it really it, it is so disappointing because i am the first one to defend uh, Comic Con when people go, well, it's all corporate now and it's all about all age. It's all about the TV and the movies. Nobody gives a shit about the comics. Like, not true. Right. Not I true. If you, yeah. I always will when I would go to Comic Con. I'm not going this year. No, no protests or anything. Honestly, too goddamn expensive. Yeah, right. It's too expensive. I mean, yeah. not even, well, even I, Jimmy yeah. Palmiotti yeah. on, on uh, social media is like, uh, we're going, but it costs this much thousands for me and Amanda to be there this week. And it wasn't that much different from my individually going, and I'm not living a first class life. I mean, God, I've gone to Comic-Con and stayed at my share of Motel 6s and the equivalent right. of 
you know, oh, hey, man, we all want to we all want you to MC our panel. Can you come? And it's like, well, I wasn't planning on it, but I guess I'm going now and literally have to drop a thousand or two. And this is a couple of years, 10 years ago. Yeah, now and now it's only more. more $12 yeah. for a soda down there. I mean, and, and you know, man, you got to you got to spring break it like you're a kid yeah. and share a room with four, if not more people. And I mean, I, I love stories like my buddy Sal Abinati saying, oh, sleeping in the bathtub when I went one year yeah, or, man. you know, I'm living on trail mix yeah, and, and water right. fountains for four days. I'm hoping there's free food at the after parties. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm staying oh, with dude. one of the Comic-Con OGs about 20 minutes away. We're take, I'm taking the trolley in every day. I mean, you know, I would, yep. otherwise I wouldn't be able to go. Are you kidding me? Even Fanographics was like, oh, we got some discounted hotel rooms. It's only $350 a night times four plus the uh, the, the the planes plus, plus <laughs> the food. I mean, are you kidding me? I don't have an extra couple thousand dollars for something like this. Absolutely. Right now. I, so, I, yeah. I still hear you, man. And it, and it really, and again, we all accept that. But by the same token, like I started to say, Comic Con didn't forget its history and didn't forget right. the smaller panels. Um, yes. and doesn't usually, and again, it, it likely is this contention with you guys specifically that is it is this unauthorized history that they don't want a part of. And it's like, don't forget where you came from, man. No, it's, it's true, that it's that simple. There, there was also there were even some people who were saying, well, you know, maybe Comic Con will do its own history. Uh, Comic Con will will have a panel um, about itself. Otherwise, and we we've seen the program schedule. There's nothing. There's not. They're not even doing an Ursaz version of this, which they've done in the past, frankly, where sure. they'll have a couple of random people. Again, a few people whose names I don't need mention, but at least in the community are known as not the the best uh, chroniclers of the community talking about Comic Con. They they don't even have that. I mean, they rejected us, and they don't even have their own or a similar history of Comic Con, which is absurd and ridiculous. And I'll just say it right now because I know a lot of people are angry. Um, even the tribute panel they're doing to Greg Bear, um, who I became very close with, and is a, was a great man, and passed away some months ago. Even the tribute uh, uh, panel that they're having for him, thank goodness, at least they're doing something, is not at the best time. And yeah, what, what well, time is it, man? I don't even know. It's, so it's, thir it's Thursday night at 8. Um, and Greg Bear was one of the creators of Comic-Con. He was one of the original group of San Diego kids who made this happen. He became a best-selling science fiction author. Um, he ended up later down the road even doing a lot of the Halo video game adaptations, for example. His wife, once again, Astrid Bear, amazing woman, great woman, uh, very important in her own right for cosplay and a lot of what she did with Star Trek and so forth early on. Her dad was Paul Anderson, another just uh, you know quintessential science fiction writer right up there with people like Heinlein and Bradbury and others. Yeah. Um, you know, people considered... Astrid royalty of the fandom scene and rightly so and she should still be considered that way and so the fact that they are having Greg's panel on Thursday night a lot of people are a little upset about because that's not the best timing and uh, yet another representative of someone within the comic-con world now has told us you know that is what they do they you know because they don't think that these tribute panels bring in a lot of people and look we all know that Comic-Con is struggling right now. All the articles are out there. Uh, people know that since the president, John Rogers, died a few years ago, there's been a lot of instability. And then, of course, COVID and the lockdown really affected things. Just changes in the industry, changes in the economy right now. Interest rates being as high as they are. All these things are affecting Comic-Con. Now they've got to deal with the strike or strikes, plural. I get it. They really need to do what they can to make this marketable and saleable and to bring money in. But they also can't keep pushing away and dismissing, as you said, this history. And and a lot of it is, again, as I say, too, it's just bad optics. It's so noticeable. I mean, we all know what's going on. We can all see it. We can all understand it. And there are people who are crying out, you know, why aren't you doing more with this podcast or this book? Why aren't you doing your own history at, as a panel? Why aren't you 
even having a larger presence at the Comic-Con Museum. I mean, even things like that, even if it's not us, the people who actually, you know, are putting this all together, like, do your own thing. They're not even doing that. Where is the Comic-Con documentary? Where is the... There, where's their own podcast? I mean, they're not doing anything with it. It's like they're hiding or something. It's very strange and it doesn't make sense. And uh, aside from, you know, I don't know, corruption, laziness, incompetence. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't even want to say those words necessarily, but I, I, otherwise it's illogical. You know, make something at the Comic Con Museum, have a panel about the history of Comic Con. Put the tribute of Greg Bear, and they're doing a, a, a George Clayton Johnson panel, too, at better times when more people will come. Promote it more. Talk about it more. Push your own things. I, it doesn't make any sense they're not doing more with all this material. Um, aside from, I don't know, some of the pejoratives I was saying earlier. I mean, I don't know what else to say. It, it's very confusing and frustrating at the same time. And, again, I've... We've been doing this now for a couple of years. The book just came out in September. Um, we've been dealing with this all along the way. People told us this would happen. And uh, I just thought, you know, and that was, it, it kind of motivated me to make the book as great as it is. I mean, there's, I'm, I'm sorry. There's no question. The book's amazing. It just is. It looks great. Our designer, John Charlie, did a fantastic job. Gary Groth and Fanographics put a lot of money and time and energy into it's full color. The papers I've got people who have said, wow, the binding of the cover is so incredible, you know, especially right now. And while we were dealing with supply demand issues back, you know, when this is first coming out, I mean, yes. everyone and everything, every part of this, the designers and the copy editors and the people doing the binding and the printing wanted to make something that was really special. And God damn it, we did it. And Comic Con is just shrugging its shoulders, and it, it makes no sense at all. They really need to just drop the ego, stop making it about those six or eight people who run Comic Con and don't talk to anybody and don't listen to anybody and don't read any of the criticisms and don't care about any of that, and make this about what it was supposed to be about in the early days. Shell Dorf, the founder, was not the most beloved person then or now either. No. But everyone can admit that without him, there would not be a Comic-Con. And you read interviews with him and you listen to interviews with him, some of which we have in the podcast, some of which we represent in the book. And he was yes. about interactivity and engagement and sharing. And, you know, it's a nonprofit, for goodness sakes. It's supposed to be by fans for fans. And we have this little contingent of scared, angry venal people who are making this about themselves and their friends and it's unfortunate um and we're losing people like greg bear and gene henderson and others who won't be around to keep telling their story anymore and they won't be around to go to these panels and they won't be around to sign their books and they won't be around to do these things i mean you know just to wrap this part up you know trina robbins is so important to the community god damn it and, you know, she was the first female underground comics creator. She's the Trina that Joni Mitchell is singing about in Ladies of the Canyon. She dated Harlan Ellison when she was younger. She created the clothing for people like Mama Cass and Donovan and others. She was doing stuff in New York and San Francisco and L.A. and everywhere. And, you know, uh, we did an event with her because she's part of our book and podcast at the Cartoon Museum in San Francisco. And, um, you know, she was telling me that, you know, she is – having her own financial problems and she's having difficulty, you know, keeping out there and she's married, you know, she's partners with Steve Lealoha, another very important person in the Absolutely. scene. Absolutely, They're having, you know, troubles and they should not be having those problems. Agreed. You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. They, they should be feted and they should be celebrated and there should be documentaries about both of them. And, and they should not be worrying about money and they should not be worrying about, any of the issues that they're worrying about at their age because they've done so much together and separately. And where, where's Comic-Con to support that? Um, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And we need to do everything we can to get these people the spotlight they deserve, maybe even, you know, the money they deserve, maybe even the credit they deserve. This goes back to, you were talking about before with Neil Adams and people like Jerry Robinson and others 
who had to say, hey, let's get some money for Joe, you know, and, and Jerry. I mean, Joe, oh, yeah. God, it's it's ridiculous. What are you kidding yes. me? The creators of Superman, you know, or, or you know, some of these other creators from back in the day. I mean, Bill Kirby. Fink, Bill hey, your cover to die. Before. Well, even even your cover subject Kirby, yeah. who literally till the day he died was fighting to get a lot of his original art back. And yeah. listen, we all miss Stanley. We all respect Stanley. That yeah. said, it was so disappointing. He was on a Hollywood memorabilia show, and he's like, "Well, in my warehouse," and they actually showed footage of him showing fantastic four pages of Jack Kirby art. And it's like, oh, Stan. You couldn't give Jack a couple of these pages back. I mean, it's it really it's so Their disappointing. Documentary is ridiculous. I mean, well, yeah, and that certainly is getting it. And thankfully, and then Jack's uh, son has been talking about it, and his granddaughter. Yeah, yeah, Lisa too. No, yeah. and also I wanted to know Matthew because again, I I can't stress it enough for the audio audience, and I'll put the put the banner banner back up as well. You've got to see you at San Diego, uh, or pardon me, Comic Con begins the podcast. Um, while you were collecting these interviews, did you shoot video? Could you make a video documentary along with what we have now as an audio wonderful eight hour series that is available on all the podcast platforms? Um, we we did we did because we were literally doing this at the at the cre at the start of and peak of COVID. I mean, this all really came together. Our original development started in january 2020 i mean my our original idea was to do a book first and we were going to go out to san diego we were going to go see greg and astrid in seattle we were going to go all over the country and and meet with these people and talk with them both to get the audio um but also to put the book together but i i was saying you know we should do some video too for that very reason and then of course three months later march 2020 comes around and uh, COVID and lockdown happened, and that was when we shifted gears to the podcast because, frankly, the publishing industry was just um, in total pandemonium as ev everywhere else was. But Sirius XM and a buddy of mine there who's a producer, they were one of the companies that said, hey, people are going to be inside. They're going to need some new content. Let's put some stuff together and work with us on remotely getting the interviews that we needed, both through things like Zoom, but also we were mailing you know, mobile recording devices to people. Sure. All these things underwrited by uh, Sirius and Stitcher, which was great. Um, so, uh, you know, when we got all this material, it was done that way. Now, you know, the Zooms look good. And we also were gifted video footage of interviews through Pamela Jackson and San Diego State Uni University through their Comic-Con Kids Project. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, look, all I'll say is we've done the book, we've done the podcast. There's an audiobook version of the book through Blackstone with an entire cast of characters. You know, let's be honest, there's only one more place to go, and we're working to make that happen. Um, and, um, you know, I probably shouldn't say, and I'm probably not supposed to say, but yeah, I mean, there's things coming together Good. to try to make that happen, and it should happen. And once again, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the film Social Network, uh, although I love the book that it was based on. Um, but there's a great scene, you know, where the Mark Zuckerberg character, Jesse Eisenberg, says, you know, I, I created Facebook because without me, it didn't exist beforehand. And, um, you know, the reality is that uh, a lot of people, even within the Comic-Con community, wanted to do a history or an oral history or documentary or a book like this. And for whatever reason, just couldn't do it or didn't do it or weren't able to make it happen. And we did. Um, and it's not just me. It is Wendy All, and it is Scott Shaw, and it is Jeff Smith and Stan Sakai and Riza and Mike Towery and Roger Friedman and Gary Groth and Jonathan Barley and the many other people who worked with us behind the scenes and so-called in front of the scenes to make this book happen and our team over at SiriusXM to make the podcast happen. I was just the Phil si facilitator. Uh, that's why, you know, people ask me, oh, why aren't you in the book? Why aren't you the the person hosting on the podcast, not my story. You know, it's Brink Stevens story. She should be the the host of the podcast. You know, it's it's Scott Shaw's story and Trina Robbins story. Um, it's not my story to tell. I'm just the one who figured out how to, I was the impresario. I'm the straight right. man. I'm the one. You're the, who, well, you're the producer. I'm you're putting producer. all these together. Yeah. And, yeah, no one, you know, and it's not because I'm so amazing. It was just because 
No one else was doing it. I knew it needed to be done. I knew people wanted to do it. I became extremely close with, and I'm extremely close with almost everyone involved in this project. Um, and they're my friends now, and they're my heroes. I, I, you know, I love a lot of these people, you know, and, and I really want to make sure that before they're gone, they have the opportunity to tell these stories and in a way that gets amplified and really? in a way that is heard and known and understood. Rolling Stone magazine in 2017, not that long ago, has an origin story of Comic-Con. In the first sentence, John, it, it, it says New York Comic-Con and San Diego Comic-Con are the same thing. And anybody who's listened to this long enough into this episode and anybody who knows anything about Comic-Con knows how ridiculous that is on every possible level. That's like saying Star Trek and Star Wars is the same thing. New York Comic-Con and Com San Diego Comic-Con are not the same thing. And I know for a fact that multiple people who were interviewed for that article and multiple OG Comic-Con people hit up the writer and hit up Rolling Stone and said, hey, can you please change that? That's wrong. And I think it's still up that way. And Probably. there's a lot of other errors in that in that article. And we all know that Rolling Stone over the last few years hasn't proven to be the most credible source either. Absolutely, unfortunately. Still yes. such a large outlet. And for them to get something like that so wrong in the first sentence, that's so dangerous. Because that's the kind of thing that ends up on Wikipedia. That's the kind of thing that ends up on these late night shows. That's the kind of thing that ends up on other podcasts or radio shows or celebrities are promulgating that that total misinformation and total misunderstanding. I mean, there's so much that's so different about New York and San Diego. It's absurd. Um, and a little bit of research, you know, they wouldn't have done that anyway. So it just shows how lazy that writer was. But, you know, that's not the only instance where we can no. say that. That And so here it is. Here is the actual story by the people who are in the room. And Comic-Con itself is not doing what it can with it. Uh, and that's that's unfortunate. Um, uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I am going to be there. I'm doing signings at the Fanagraphics booth, as I said, at 1721. Um, Scott Shaw and a few other people are going to be doing some things to help promote it as well. Because they see this as their book. They see this as their podcast, and rightly so. Uh, you know, nobody's making any money on this. Certainly not them. But, you know, they want their story to be heard. This isn't about money, unfortunately. This is about getting their story heard and the story of Comic-Con told correctly. And if CCI, the current committee, is not going to do it, well, we're going to just kind of shove them to the side the way they've shoved us to the side. And we're going to do it anyway. You know what? We're going to do it within the convention themselves. So that's too bad. And hopefully, eventually, they see what we're doing and see the value of it and say, you know what, guys? We're, we're going to work with you here. We're going to do what we can. We'll have the book and, and panels We'll have at the museum, and we'll do these other things, and hopefully that happens. And if not, you know, things change, and people come and go, even from the Comic-Con committee, and, um, you know, this book is going to continue to survive, and the podcast is too, and uh, eventually they'll be gone, and um, the podcast and the book will survive, and maybe yeah. it won't be soon. Maybe it'll be in five or ten years that – once they're gone, you know, we'll have to kind of come in and say, okay, here we are. Here it is. And people will say, boy, why didn't they do anything with this before? And we'll say, boy, why didn't anybody talk about Bill Finger as the co-creator or creator of Batman or give more praise to Joe and Jerry of Superman or whatnot? And you know, Jerry Robinson, too. Yeah. 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 Stories no, much, you know, so. Matthew, uh, you know, and Ward Balloon uh, fans know that one of my biggest complaints is there are so many of us, and when I say us, I mean podcasters. I hate to use the word pundit, but fine. For the purposes of what I'm about to say, I will include that. That think they know everything about the history of nerd culture, and they and the, the newbies get it wrong. Right. And I'm glad you point out that Rolling Stone article because it nothing infuriates me more. And yeah. as I always say, from the '90s on, every fart has been <laughs> documented yeah. and much to the contention of politicians who I never said that. Well, here's the video. And, um, and unfortunately it is that 20th century history that there are gaps and you need people like yourself and the actual survivors that lived the life and told and actually lived the tale to later tell it. Let's get these people on the record because truly, especially particularly in comic books, 
Nothing gets me angrier than, and I, my favorite person to uh, comment on is the inker Vinnie Coletta and the artist Vinnie Coletta. And everyone's all oh, Vinnie Coletta. Well, you know, he, he erased so many of Jack Kirby's lines. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes, he did. He also saved Marshall Rogers and Steve Englehart's mm -hmm. infamous seventies Joker Batman story with the laughing fish. And DC was ready to like cut those guys off without finishing their story. And it was Vinny, who was the art director, who stepped up and said, these guys are telling a great story. You got to let them finish. And they mm -hmm. did. And it's like, so tell the whole story. And the same goes for Comic-Con, except the fact that a bunch of kids, hippies, counterculture people, and yes, establishment people, all yeah. got together and made this incredible happening that still exists, is still an amazingly great time. I always urge anyone who has not only the ability to get in the convention, but be in San Diego around the convention yeah. in the gas lamp district and experience because it does, it spills out in the streets with so much other fresh and new and, or I should say free content that yeah. you can appreciate and exhibits and other things. A good friend of mine in radio, she and her husband and her two kids are like, Oh, you know, we're going to San Diego, but we can't get tickets. I'm like, go. You'll have a blast. It's, it's like it. being in the parking lot at the Grateful Dead concerts. I mean, that's half of the fun, you know? You got it, man. <laughs> Tailgating at, at your yeah, favorite is, sporting event. Yeah. Absolutely, man. And that's the thing. And you don't want to lose that. Yeah. And literally to the level of tailgating because you got the, the street food people who not only have their food trucks out there, but also the great uh, tradition of grilling outside fresh and hey, you want a fresh uh, hot dog or bratwurst? Where they're making them right there, and right. they're right in, they're right across the street from the convention center, selling just even stuff like that, and it's fantastic. It is such a good time, and and it's almost a good echo of these origins. But get the story straight right. and get it from the people who lived it. And yeah. no, dude, not only Rolling Stone, but I can tell you from a sports side, Sports Illustrated is not the magazine that it was for 50 plus years, but everyone has gone on the cheap. They hire younger writers that, that write articles now that don't do their research properly. Mm -hmm. They yep. have editors that don't know the full history. So a lot of this shit just flies through like, well, you know, he wrote the story, so I'm sure he got it straight. Well, no, they didn't. And that's really, like I say, you can hear the anger in my voice. I mean, it's, no, for sure. it's very, very, I mean, so I'm with for you, man. Sure. And, that's, and that's why I'm happy to have you on and tell people, hey, you want the real story? Get Matthew's book. See you at San yeah. Diego. Or, or listen, listen for free to the podcast. I mean, yeah, Comic Con, really, Comic -Con yeah. begins. I mean, yeah, I mean I mean, these are these are these are great examples and true stories from the people that experienced them themselves. Wonderful photos in the book, like you said. I mean, just this cover shot alone. I love this. And I always want to know. I always forget who the guy is to the left of Jack Kirby there. It's not Frank Zappa. It was a radio DJ who was really big in the community at the time. Yeah. He talked about Comic-Con a lot named Jeff Gelb. Great guy. Unfortunately, um, you know, he himself, I, I wanted to interview him. and He's been very supportive of the project. He loved that he's on the cover. Uh, but he 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 stepped away because he said, you know, this isn't my story to tell. I want these the kids to tell their own story. Um, so he was very supportive kind of in the background and I still talk to him to this day. Um, but you know, he wanted to be their story and not his story, but yeah, it was radio, the local San Diego radio DJ, Jeff Gelb, um, that was very big in the scene, uh, at that time. And, and just behind Kirby also is Clayton Moore, who was again, another early Comic-Con contributor, the guy who's leaning over with his glasses. Um, I don't yeah. think we remember or know who the other gentleman is. But that is uh, Clayton Moore with the glasses there. And he's actually the one who provided us the photo um, and has also been very helpful. And still is in the San Diego area. He's a teacher. He does online comics. Uh, and he, he was so helpful with this entire project. Has a lot of information. Goes to a lot of different panels and whatnot. So uh, he'll, he'll be at Comic-Con this year as well. So Understood, man. No, everyone, I urge you. Comic-Con begins eight hours, eight, eight chapters. Very thorough. Listen to it for free on all your podcast platforms and truly uh, do yourself the extra favor of picking up this wonderful book from Fantagraphics, See You at San Diego, that Matthew put together, this wonderful oral history. Um, you know, Matthew, I also want to talk about uh, your buddy, your Simpsons buddy, Mike Reese, who ironically found himself in the news because <laughs> he took that yes, he uh, ride to visit the Titanic years ago. 
and is a guy that lived to tell the tale of, uh, and even I saw in the articles interviewing him and stuff. And again, this is more Mike's story. I hope to get him back to uh, talk about this. Maybe definitely. I'm sure. Yeah. But everybody else that was, he actually has a new, he has a podcast he's been doing for the last few years called, yeah. Um, what am I doing here? It's a fantastic podcast about himself and his lovely wife, Denise, who's an amazing woman in her own right. They travel around the world. and They go to all different kinds of crazy places. They've been to the North Pole multiple times, the South Pole, every country, every place you can imagine they've been to. It's, it's what they do when Mike's not writing for The Simpsons. And they did take a trip down in the same sub, the Titan, uh, to Titanic. And he did an episode of his podcast about that about a year or so ago, but because of the media storm that hit him so hard, all of a sudden, I mean, I was hearing from people, because for those who don't know, I uh, co-wrote Mike's book, Mike Reese's book, Springfield Confidential, about his time at The Simpsons, which he's still at, um, and other projects he's done. He was the co-creator of the great animated series, The Critic, and he was an uncredited writer on an Airplane 2. Um, he's written for the Academy Awards. And the so Tonight forth. Show. The John uh -huh. Carson tonight. Yeah, show. Joan Rivers and Gary Shandling, of course. He wrote for Alf and Charles in Charge. Um, and, you know, he named the minions from Despicable Me. Mike Reese is, is one of the great legends of comedy writing still alive today. He helped to create the careers of people like Judd Apatow, Conan O'Brien, and many others. But um, he actually did an entire podcast that just came out this last week about the media storm that hit him because – People realized he had been, you know, as a quote unquote celebrity, he had been on the ride a couple of years ago. And he, you know, New York Times, CNN, BBC, everything. He did an entire podcast episode that's very funny and interesting that just came out. And that too is free everywhere. Uh, what am I doing here? He's actually doing it as a book soon as well. Uh, it's an incredibly well put together podcast in itself. Listen to his Oscars 2023 podcast episode just came out a few weeks ago it's so good so funny and i will admit i sent him a funny joke about avatar way of water and he said i'm going to use that in my podcast not only did he use it in his podcast he credits me for it oh that's great so, uh, yeah what an honor uh I'm, I'm writing a joke for one of the great writers of comedy living today um but uh no that i when he sent me he sent me a few segments of his podcast. And what's great about them too, unlike you know, myself and you, John, we're very loquacious. Mike's podcast episodes are all 15 minutes. Which yeah, is, they're real brief. Exactly. They're, yeah. they're, they're little tidbits. I mean, that's how he likes to do stuff. That's cool. But um, uh, uh, he sent me one of the segments of his Oscars podcast episode, and it is probably the funniest thing I've ever read. My wife and I at the time, uh, she was cracking up along with me. I actually emailed Mike because anybody knows, especially comedy people, that being funny when you're talking or on stage is one thing. But being funny on paper is extremely difficult. Almost nobody can do it. And I, I, I was having trouble reading it aloud because it was so funny. And I actually emailed Mike and I said, please don't send me any more of your segments because – I'm going to read them and it's going to ruin when I hear it. I want to hear your voice because Mike also has a very unique cartoonish oh, yeah. kind of voice that just goes so well with the material. And I said, I, I don't want to spoil it. Like, just please don't send me anymore uh, because I know it's this is going to be an amazing episode and I want to just hear it like everybody else will. I don't want to cheat because otherwise it'll ruin it for me a little bit. So uh, yeah, check out his Oscars 2023. And he was also, he was right on the money about a lot of his predictions. And I mean, Mike's an incredible person. He's one of my best friends and such a funny, smart person just to know him and to have worked with him as I have a few times now on his book, Springfield Confidential, which everyone should check out, especially the audiobook version that's read by Mike. His voice is so funny and goes so well with the material. Um, I just feel very honored and blessed. And, you know, same thing with him with The Simpsons as with our people with Comic-Con. Uh, you know, who knows better? There's a million books about The Simpsons. There's a million podcasts and documentaries about The Simpsons. But guess what? There is one insider long-form history of The Simpsons. One. Only one. Ours is the only one. Springfield Confidential. Hank Azaria and... 
uh, Nancy Cartwright and others, you know, talk about it in their autobiographies a little bit as well. But as far as a full history of The Simpsons told from someone who's been there since the beginning, Mike Reese, one of two people who's written for the show since it started, ours is the only one. And those are the kinds of projects that I prefer to work on and be with. It's not my opinion. It's not my speculation. I'm not looking at Wikipedia. I'm not Googling these things. I'm talking to the people who were there. And that's the stuff that we need to get. Studs Turkle, Alan Lomax, Harry Smith, George Plimpton, Gilbert Seldes, Bill Shelley, Bill Warren. These are the people, you know, these days, James Andrew Miller, uh, Legs McNeil with the punk oral history, Charlie Ahorn with the hip hop oral history. These are the people who are really getting the material together from the people who told it, from the people who said it, and they're not around for forever. And that's what we are aspiring to do. Um, and whether Comic Con Current wants to help us or not, you know, we're a, it's a shame, but um, you know, we're gonna keep going. And yeah, you know, we did the books, we did the podcast. There's only one more place to go, and we're going there. And uh, they can either be part of that or not. And eventually, they'll be gone, and we'll we're gonna still keep going even after that. So that's all that there is to it. You know, uh, hopefully we can work something out. You know, even before I got involved with Word Balloon, when I was working in sports one of my uh interests was to get the record straight right. the movie the ron howard movie cinderella man yeah. about james braddock has a lot of historic inaccuracies and right. also really does a disservice to the champion before jim braddock max bear who was lethal killed two men in the ring wasn't proud of it the way they depict him in the movie and um max bear jr jethro from the beverly hillbillies <laughs> still alive and this was you know 15 years ago maybe even a little bit more and i'm like and i reached out to him when i was working at sporting news radio and i said they're getting your dad's story wrong do you want to correct the record he said absolutely yeah. so we did this hour-long interview it's on my word balloon feed it's on my big bout podcast feed and it's and it's max jr uh, really reclaiming his father's history and whether it's that or other sports documentaries that I was involved with from an audio standpoint at Sporting News Radio, a, a good portion of my work was to get the record straight. Right. And talk to people who knew and spoke and interviewed the actual people that lived the history and stuff. So no, I'm with you, man. And I and I agree. And also another great oral history that you uh did was your Nickelodeon book as well. And the and the start and, and the history of Nickelodeon. And that's the thing, man. These are the, was that also an unauthorized uh oh you better believe it in fact. You know, um, I, uh, we had been putting that project together. It's called Slime and an Oral History of Nickelodeon's Golden Age. We talked to over 250 people forward by Mark Summers. Very similar situation where, you know, I didn't need Viacom or Nickelodeon to help us because I got Mark Summers and M Melissa Jones sure. and Keenan Thompson and the creators of all the shows and all the, the people who did all the music and, and the, the costumes and everything else. And by the way, this was before social media really got big. I mean, Sorry, folks. I'm good at this. I don't know what to tell you. Humility would be damned. Um, you want me to do your oral history? I'm, I'm the guy to do it. I mean, I get this done, period. Um, so I did the Nickelodeon oral history. And yeah, about six months or seven months into the project, when I was almost done getting it all together, over 3,000 pages of line notes. And I'd have multiple friends helping me with transcribing all the interviews. I think we had over 300 hours of material and so forth. Um, Nickelodeon did hit me up and it's a very memorable moment because a, they said, Oh, we hear you're doing a book on Nickelodeon. And I said, yes, I am. And they said, well, you know, Oh, do you need any help or anything? I said, no, I'm good because I was, I was already almost done. Um, and of course I can hear the nervousness in her voice and she tells me, she goes, Oh, you know what? What, what are you writing about? And I said, I, and I and I wanted to to comfort her. I wanted, and I said, look, I'm in my late twenties. I grew up on these shows. I, this is a celebration. Yes, it'll be a little warts and all, but ultimately, it's a tribute and a celebration to your network. She said, okay, good. And she goes, and I said, also, I want you to know it's really. I'm just focusing on the early years. And she goes, oh, you mean like all that? And I went, no, 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 we're, we're stopping at all that. You know, like, no, no, you know, shows like Pete and Pete and Ren and Stimpy and You Can't Do Them Television. She didn't seem to know what I was talking about. So even that was sort of an example of, you know, and I've had that happen before too. We, I, was, I also did the Mark Summers documentary on your mark. 
And uh, we actually went and shot the 30th anniversary of Double Dare Celebration at Comic-Con in 2016. And Nickelodeon dispatched its own little team of very young, um, you know, TV producers, I guess, uh, you know, to, to shoot some of what was going on with Mark while we were shooting our stuff. So we had two different crews going on at the same time. And um, it was pretty clear that the young gals who were part of that crew didn't even really know who Mark was, didn't really know what Double Dare was. And, you know, you sit there and you go, boy, you know, you know, you're working at this network. Why don't you do a little research into the history? And, and hey, I, I did the book on it. I can give you a copy of it. Um, so that's always kind of interesting. And that's not the only time when something like that's come up where you sit there and you go, I mean, Mark even has a story, Mark Summers, about being at NBC and, you know, top, you know, floor and pitching to these, you know, these kids who got there because of their, their uncles or whatever and have no idea what they're talking about. And he mentioned Johnny Carson and one of the kids said, uh, you know, in this suit and everything, Mad Men style, well, who's that? And Mark's just like, you know, he's the guy, he's why you're here right now. He's the guy who built this building. You're, you should, you know, be, be praying at his votive candle or whatever it is. And uh, the kid actually told him, oh, we don't care about that old crap anymore. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, you know, you sit there and you go, not only do you not know, but you're dismissive of it in that way. Like you're at NBC listening to a pitch penthouse, you know, uh, floor and you don't know who Johnny Carson is. And then you're going to just like shade him like that. Like what is going on? I mean, and, and, you know, Johnny Carson in particular is one of those people where it's not just like, Oh, that's historically interesting. Like, no, no learn how to do that correctly from somebody who will make you laugh in five friggin' seconds and who knows how to do it, knows how to do interviews and knows who, who really developed and popularized that entire thing. Yeah. The, the late night talk show obviously existed before him, even the tonight yes. show existed before him, sure. but I mean, Johnny really brought it together 30 friggin years, you know, yes. Fallon's not going to be able to do that. I mean, come no. on, you know, no, you're right, man. Show. Yeah. Yeah. It's not Fallon. No. Carson uh, doing it himself, man. No, he was, you're right. He, I mean, Steve Allen and Jack Parr had the Tonight Show before yeah. Johnny Carson. Yeah, and Steve, you know, those guys were great too. Steve Allen also brings out Lenny Bruce. I mean, those guys. And, the and Jack Parr. For the five years Jack Parr yeah. did it was very important as well. Yeah. But it's like two or three years with Allen, five years with Parr, 30 years right. with Johnny. Johnny it's was so funny. He's so good. And he doesn't have to do anything. It's like Jack Benny, like what, or, or Bob Newhart. Like sometimes just doing nothing is funny. Like Absolutely. that's so hard to do. You know, or like yeah. David Letterman or something like that. Like, yes. that's so hard to do, you know, and they friggin' did it. And to not know who those people are and to not get that story correct and to have people working at the companies, listening to pitches and doing development and programming. I mean, you just sit there and you go, you know, the people writing for Saturday Night Live even know who, uh, you know, Tom Davidson is or, or any of these other people yeah. like that or, 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 or even Belushi, or, I mean, it's just like, you, you sit there and you go, do you even know your own history? I mean, it's, it's just absurd, you know, Jim Downey. It's like, do any of those people even know who Jim Downey is? I mean, you know, like it's, it's just like, and the show is so not what it was. And it's like the opposite of what it is, what it was. It is the status quo. Now it is the establishment now. And that happened with Nickelodeon and it happened with MTV and it happened with punk rock and with hip hop and with so many of these different irreverent, um, you know, punk rock, uh, counterculture institutions. And, you know, we're watching it happen with Comic-Con now. And it's just a shame. The philosopher Hegel referred to this as the absolute recoil. It, it's the same thing that happened. You know, it's Animal Farm, man. You yes, know, yes, and yes, he yes. was there during the Russian Revolution. He saw it happen, George Orwell, or the French Revolution, where you know, it, and, and really the Who, you know, old new boss like the old boss, they, you right. know, all these dictators, Castro or whomever. It's like they were the underdog. They become in charge, then they become the bad guy. It's like, what are we doing? Come on! Well, stop well, it already stop. We don't want to. We don't want to be the old men yelling on the porch. But you're right. <laughs> And I've certainly experienced myself, wow. e even within my own family. And, you know, my buddy Rob Burnett always makes the point, and he's right, that most pop culture has a, has a 
shelf life of about 20 years. Yeah. We're yeah. seeing it right now with the reaction to the new Indiana Jones, which I've seen yeah. in as an excellent Indiana Jones movie. But this indifference of, I don't want to see an 80 year old man running around. And it's like, okay, I get it, but um, don't just slough it away. And I've heard that too, where, well, it happened before my lifetime, so it doesn't matter. No, and, it's like, you know, well, and then as you're pointing out, history will, will repeat itself and yeah. it's doomed to repeat itself from that kind of attitude. And you don't have to listen. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to love everything, but you do have to acknowledge that it existed. And there's a reason why it mattered. And as you say, if it weren't for Johnny Carson, there wouldn't be a Jimmy Fallon tonight. Show. Right. I mean, it's that simple and, and you're right about that. And it's, Again, I, it's that's why I am okay with talking about nerd history on this show yeah. and always will because I want the record set straight as long as I'm around to I, I explain the inaccuracies of others out there who think they know what they're talking about. And I don't know everything. And I get schooled no, all the time. Neither do well. I. And no, nobody does. But, I no. mean, it's important to bring those actual people together. And going back to even what you said about, you know, Harrison Ford or whatever, the 80-year-old man, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, you know, it's it's a great line from a fantastic play by Herb Gardner. Uh, I love Herb Gardner. Go on. Yeah, you know, I'm not Rappaport. It's like, you know, may, maybe you should listen to these older people. Maybe we're old because we're survivors. Exactly. You know, like maybe we do know what we're talking about. You know, maybe this because I said so. You should just shut your mouth sometimes because yeah. you know I I've even said this sometimes. I mostly hang around as people can probably tell with much older people. I always have even when I was younger. Um, but I have a few younger friends, and every now and then I get a little frustrated with them, and I'll say that might be true, but there's one thing I can do that you'll never be able to do. And they go, "What?" And I go, "Be ten years older than you." You know, and there's something to that. And I will give you, you know, uh, two words that will prove that an 80 year old man could still kick everyone else's butt. Mad Max, you know, George Miller, you kidding me? Who else is going to do Fury Road? Are you kidding me? And it's all practical. Uh -uh. This guy is coming out there and being like, out of my way there, kids. Let me show you how it's done. I'm going to make a movie that is one long car chase in the desert. We're going to do it practical. And you just sit over there and watch how the master does it. I haven't made a movie in a long time. But let, let me show you what an 80-year-old man can do. And, oh, my God. Wow. I mean, Fury I Road. Mean. The end. I mean, you know, that's what – when people who know what they're doing, those old men and old women in the scene – Get out of the way and let them make Fury Road. Because if you let them make Fury Road, they make Fury Road. Because those guys know what they're doing. You know, if John Carpenter made another movie right now, like, oh, my God, how amazing. Like, listen to his music. He's releasing music now and his records and whatnot. He always did his music. But it's like, man, who else is doing music like that right well, now? Well, and Eastwood and Clint Eastwood is, is going to give oh. us his last movie in his 90s. Yeah. And that's great. Roger Corman, I don't know why, but... I've fallen into a YouTube rabbit hole where I've been watching Roger Corman interviews and he's 95 and thankfully he has his younger wife to co-produce with him, but yeah. he's still making movies. No, and also, George Burns or Norman Lear or yeah, Paul Reiner not, only just passed away. I it's mean, not it's like, wis you know, I always say regarding old people, it's not wisdom, it's perspective right. because they've lived a full life and they've seen because just these periods in creative lives or any life everybody goes through this when all and again i don't mean to be the old man yelling on the porch i hear all the people that are recently graduated from college and the amount of debt they have and certainly it's bigger than the debt i had in the 80s but i didn't finish paying my student loans till i was in my late 30s because that's just the way it was and it's like oh man this sucks and i'm not in my career and i'm 21 and it's like Welcome to your 20s. Yeah, exactly. That's what happens yeah. in your 20s. You take these retail jobs or restaurant jobs or whatever until you're able to break into your career. And right. you can't just walk out of college and go, I'm here. Where's my uh where's my six-figure salary? Right. It just doesn't work that it's way. Not these days. Yeah. And then yeah, man. And again, with the WGA strike and the actor strike, God only knows how all this is gonna hash out. But no, man, I, I'm with you, and again. This is why the record needs to be set straight. This is why you need to read See You at San Diego from Fanagraphics and Matthew Clickstein. And also, again, please, uh, by all means, get on uh, your favorite podcast platform 
and listen to Comic Con Begins. It is a great production. It's eight parts. It's just it really is. It it really provides a lot of facts about the history of nerd fandom, San Diego. And hey, we won. But don't you want to know how the struggle yeah. began? How we and, won. Yeah, and yeah, and how we won. I mean, it's it, it really, like you said, it's not pop culture, it's culture, right. like it or not. And and you get you're telling a great story, man. And you got the right people to tell their story. So All thank you. Them, yeah. Yeah, over, over over fifty of them, and for those who might not know, this includes uh, you know some really great special guests: Neil Gaiman, Frank Miller, Kevin Smith, the Russo brothers, Felicia Day, Bruce Campbell. Like John said earlier, we got Rizza from Wu Tang to do the afterward. Jeff Smith and Stan Sakai did the forward. Stan Sakai is also throughout the book as well. Lloyd Kaufman of Troma. Um, you know, people like Trina Robbins and others. I mean, there's so many fantastic people that are in this project. And who have been working with us and helping us. I mean, um, you know, Neil Gaiman, you know, is a very generous guy with his time. And he does forwards and blurbs for a lot of people. But he still, you know, really worked with us and his team. And he, you know, he has a great, he put a picture up on Twitter of him with the book and whatnot. I mean, this is something that these people are standing behind. I mean, Riza didn't just do the afterwards. He did a video about the book, talked about it. And his team has been great. So, you know, these are people who see what we've done and want to help to promote us and want to help to get that story out there and are proud of being part of it. And, you know, the only silence we're hearing is from the people who should be doing more than anybody else to get this going. I shouldn't have to submit a panel to Comic-Con for this. We should just say, hey, guess what? We have Scott Shaw and Dave Clark and Mike Towery, and we have some special guests like Tim Seeley. And Dr. Aaron Hanna, who also wrote a book about Comic Con a few years ago, about the you know from an academic point of view, and um, you know we have this person, that person. I mean, Trina Robbins wanted to be involved, and Maggie Thompson. This panel would have been amazing. I mean, there's absolutely no reason at all that they should have rejected it. I'm sorry, and I'm not going to name names, but I even have a couple of friends that I love and are great and have done some great projects and whatnot. But they have some panels going, and you know. I, yeah, I'm glad for them, and, and and I'll go and see their panels. But, I mean, it's not the same kind of substance, and it's not the same kind of, of of group of people that we were bringing together, you know, old and new. Like I said, that's how I wanted to bring in someone like Tim Seeley of Hackslash and, and other, pro, you know, and he's done so sure. much. He's one of the top writers in the scene. Uh, Absolutely. He's been a good friend for years, and he was also part of our project. I did an event with him in Chicago. Uh, to promote this book. I mean, I wanted to bring in a lot. And, and again, Dr. Aaron Hanna, who did a great book of her own called Only at Comic-Con. It was an academic press, so more of a scholarly look at it. There was a much smaller publisher a couple of years ago, but great book and was very helpful to our project. You know, I really wanted to get it from these other different angles, not just Scott Sean, Dave Clark, and, right. and Mike Towery, people who created it. I mean, there, there's, there's just no reason that this panel should have been rejected. And, and it's the second time we tried to do one last year when the book was first coming out and they rejected as well. And frankly, someone from the committee actually was bragging to, uh, you know, one of the people at Fanographics saying, oh, she was the reason why the panel was combined. So we know that they're doing this and wow. we know that they are consciously making sure that we're not getting awards and that we're not getting panels and that we're not getting the presence there. So they're not just ignoring us. They are pushing us aside intentionally. And um, it's a shame. And hopefully that changes. But again, if it doesn't, you know, all things must pass. They'll be gone soon. And, um, you know, I'm still in my early 40s and still making this happen. And, you know, we're, we're going to keep pushing ahead. Um, so and they're just going to keep looking like people will be kind of wondering what's going on there. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, I still get questions all the time. Oh, is Comic Con doing something with your book? And oh, is it, and to say nope, they're not. And it's like what? What's that about? And some of the people that are asking me this, and some of the people that are talking about this, um, are people that Comic Con cares about, and are people that Comic Con should care about, and are friends of mine, and people I know in the media, and people I know at the studios, and people that I know in the comic book industry and other industries who are saying, you know, are emailing me and saying this really looks bad for Comic Con. Um, and sometimes naming specific people that they know are very uh, put their thumb on the scales about a lot of this kind of stuff. So anyone who cares about this, anybody who's paying attention to it, anybody knows, they, they know what's going on. It's extremely obvious what's happening. Um, and no matter, you know, what little, you know, one sentence or terse 
no comment or, oh, you know, we get a lot of panel uh, submissions. We can't have them all that, uh, you know, the representatives of Comic-Con are trying to pretend to say right now. It, it, it just continues to make them look bad. Um, I agree, buddy. Listen, you'll forgive me. I got to wrap up. Yeah, but no, uh, see what I San Diego. There. <laughs> well, there you go, buddy. So no, go ahead. It's see what San Diego, everybody. A fantastic book from Fanographics, the history of Comic Con. Matthew Klitstein, thank you very much for talking to us tonight. Thanks, John. Appreciate uh, it. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for watching. Everybody, stay safe. 